I was recruited here in 1980 to chair a department of environment, a department of community medicine at the medical school, because the uh, state of New Jersey, in its wisdom, decided that it had to uh, uh, deal with the issue of. Uh, of, it, of pollution in New Jersey since it was a major concern of the public and uh, it basically sent out a directive to Rutgers, the State University and to its other state uh, programs that uh, they ought to start uh, developing some resources in this area. I'd been involved in, in the environment uh, since the 60s when I did my uh, U.S. Public Health Service two years my required two years of duty at the time for male physicians uh, uh, in the P U.S. Public Health Service Division of Air Pollution in, in uh, Los Angeles. And I had come back to NYU, which was my uh, location for being a medical student and intern and resident. I'd come back as a faculty member in the Department of Medicine and was able to continue that research with funding from EPA. And there was this new thing called NIEHS, uh, and they needed uh, to develop career development awards, and so the first year they had career development awards, I ended up with a career development award. And uh, Norton Nelson, my mentor, was leaving, was retiring from NYU, and so it gave me a chance to look around. And there was this community medicine department, five faculty, uh, and the chair was retiring. The chair had uh, developed a worldwide known program, uh, the leading program at medical schools on human sex. And um, uh, it is still, I'm told in places in the, in the state, better known <laughs> for what to work on sex and all the things we've done on the environment. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the dean uh, was a very sympathetic fellow, uh, Richard Reynolds, who really wanted to do something about the environment. and. Uh, recruited me to come here. We had a, uh, 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 we had five faculty, as I say, and uh, the idea was to build the faculty and make the program grow. Our first laboratories were in the basement. Uh, I insisted on a smoke test for the, uh, uh, the hood. The smoke came out next to the president of the university's uh, office when it came down from the first, <laughs> came up from the ground. So, I mean, we, we really weren't ready yet to do this. Um, and uh, in, uh, in trying to build this, it was clear we had to work with Rutgers University. And in fact, Rutgers University had the graduate programs, except for the MD program, basically, on, on the campus. And so all of the MD, all the medical school departments, the biochemistry department, to the extent they gave a PhD in biochemistry, came through Rutgers. And so we started to work with Rutgers and got support from, it was very strong support from Rutgers. To bring in Bob Snyder, they put in a, uh, a, a line in their graduate school for uh, a toxicologist, and uh, Dr. Robert Snyder was recruited in for that position. Uh, there was one point in which the uh, uh, Rutgers folks decided they were going to get rid of that line. They weren't going to go fund it that year. They would maybe do it in the future. And I went to see the dean of the graduate school, and I simply said that if Rutgers wasn't interested in doing it, we would do it from the funds I had at UMD and J, and we'd bring in and through UMD and J. And the very next day, Rutgers was interested in doing it. <laughs> and it was it was really in many many ways um, in dealing with the dual university thing. It was like being the, the the child of divorced parents, where you go to one parent and say, "Look what mommy gave me," and uh, you know, <laughs> and, and daddy, you know, is going to compete in this thing. And, and Rutgers. Both, both institutions saw this as a need. The, the real weakness in the state, though, was that the state looked then, and I hope no longer, uh, looked out of state for, for anything. If, they, if there was a problem, who in New York or who in Pennsylvania were the experts on that? They would not think of New Jersey having expertise. Uh, and I got this offer to uh, 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 go down to EPA to run its research and development. It was a time of transition at EPA. They'd thrown out the first head of EPA, uh, the Ronald Reagan, and brought in uh, uh, Bill Ruckel's house, and I was asked by Ruckel's house to do this. Um, and so, um, before I went away, I went away uh, being with a very clear statement with the dean, uh, Dean Reynolds, that uh, I was hoping to develop the kind of 
uh, of expertise on a national level, recognition so that we could get the recognition here and we could continue to grow and build on all the great people who have been recruited here. And uh, I'm very fortunate in, 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 in some really great people joining in on this and getting, getting good support from um, uh, the medical school and from Rutgers. Uh, at one point the program disappeared um, because of an unfortunate headline in the, in the newspaper, uh, but that was overcome uh, eventually, mainly through Rutgers, not through UMDNJ. And uh, we uh, were basically put into a situation where uh, we were, were able to get a building built, the building we're in right now, but only if we got an NIEHS center uh, we were able to get an NIEHS center uh, only if we were able to get a building built, uh, <laughs> but we still would have to go through a peer review to make sure we had the strength to do it. And uh, the, the trying to balance those two was, was always, always interesting. Uh, it, 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 uh, the NIEHS center grants were given in a much different way than they are now. It was not competition in the usual sense of the term. There was, it wasn't an open thing that said, okay, anybody send in your grant proposal. What there was was the head of NIEHS, David Rawl, uh, decided how many centers he wanted, and only if a center got lost, uh, or it's, uh, it was only, and only one center had ever been lost, uh, that was uh, uh, St. Louis University Center with a very forceful advocate who was not doing the science that perhaps they've agreed with. But anyhow, uh, the, 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 each, each center would get peer-reviewed for continuation, and only if they decided another center was needed would they add a center. And we convinced them uh, that uh, uh, another center was needed, and, uh, uh, and that New Jersey was good enough. And then Dave would decide, he wouldn't do an open competition. He would basically say, okay, I think this place is ready for it, and uh, let's have a peer review of it. And when I was, what I did was I put together an external, well, first it was Bob Snyder and I working on this together. But we put together a, an external advisory committee of some of the leading um, heads of environmental health science centers around the country. Um, and uh, I presented what we had, and when it, they were very excited about the toxicology, <laughs> thought that was great. Uh, uh, we really didn't have much in epidemiology, but then again, nobody else did at the time in terms of environmental epidemiology. Uh, but we also had what Nancy Fiedler was doing, we, uh, in, 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 in uh, basically uh, uh, public health. We had a, a, a medical component with a clinic, and we had exposure assessment, because I've always thought that dose was so crucial that we needed to have an uh, exposure assessment. And, and Bob Snyder was very, very much on top of that, and Paul Eoy was recruited to head that. And uh, when everybody presented Oh, and, and, and a very clear part that was there when I got there here in 1980 was a health, uh, uh, was Audrey Gotch who headed a program of uh, uh, health outreach and health education. She had a PhD in health education, in public health education, a true public health person. Uh, she eventually became president of the, of the American uh, uh, Association of Public Health, uh, uh, American Public Health Association. Uh, and uh, Audrey was working with K through 12 curriculum in local schools. It was really very exciting stuff. I presented all that to this group, and they immediately said, "Well, don't even let the NIEHS uh, site visitors when they come know about Audrey Gotch's work, <laughs> and maybe you can talk about the exposure assessment that Paul Leoy was doing, but only in relationship to toxicology, not in relationship to exposure." because that's what NIEHS was funding. Eventually, I mean, we developed the first program, an exposure assessment, first graduate program, and, and then on, on the uh, outreach uh, stuff, uh, when uh, Dr. Olden replaced uh, uh, Dr. Roll as head of, uh, uh, well, with interim, but when Dr. Olden came in as head of NIEHS, he insisted that every NIEHS center had to have an outreach component, and Audrey's program, our program here, became the sort of the poster child for what they needed to do, uh, which was, was very gratifying. Um, uh, see, I, I've skipped a whole bunch of things, uh, but uh, 
uh, the opening of our uh, uh, of our and I, uh, of our of the groundbreaking exercises for the EUHSI was held on a beautiful day, and we had the uh, the head of the Division of Environmental Health from the World Health Organization here as the keynote speaker, mm -hmm. and I had gotten to meet him, and he was. Uh, uh, really excited about what we were talking about doing. I got to meet him a couple of years before as this was in progress because he felt that usually academia was too narrow for the health needs that, that he was seeing as head of the World Health Organization. And he felt that our breath would be there. And so we actually scheduled the groundbreaking around his schedule <laughs> Because uh, he, he he was from Germany, he his his his, his office was in Geneva, but he, what it, he would have to come to the UN every now and then, and around his schedule coming to the UN is when the groundbreaking groundbreaking was held. Uh, Wilfred Kreisel, his name, and it was a very inspiring day. It was a great day that uh, that for all, except I left out Bob Smith, and I left out the name of our local. State Assembly, who was sitting in the front row, and and, and I, I just somehow didn't. He put was his our name lawyer in. for buying our house. Oh, is he? Yeah. He was. Yeah. Well, anyhow, um, I, I I've since made amends with him, but afterwards I realized, oh my God, how could I have done? How can I have left him out? And again, uh, he uh, um, the, the, uh, the state senator, who I think eventually went to jail, or you know, <laughs> I mean, this is New Jersey. Uh, uh, they, they were all really exceptionally helpful. Are there, are there any other buildings like Yoshi around the country? Um, yeah, well, that are with centers with programs. Yeah, University of Cincinnati built one. And in, uh, in terms of just thinking of anecdotes of building the place, uh, uh, they had had they had built one. They'd had a long-standing NIE. Uh, and HSO, one of the first, and uh, a lot of occupational and environmental health done there. Uh, and they put up a building, and they ended up with a sick building syndrome. Oh, wow. Did they? Yeah, and they basically eventually evacuated the building. So when this building was put up, I, I did a couple of things here. One is that um, the, uh, the offices tended to be on the outside with the labs on the inside. And a big fight I had with the architects was to have the window be able to open. Because to me, a large part of the sick building syndrome are people, they, we have people in here who are not, not laboratory scientists. The name, a, a laboratory science name is scary. You know, any name a chemical and it's scary. And uh, you, they're not in control of their environment. Mm -hmm. Well, if they smell something in the hall, and they can close the door and open their window, they're in control of their environment to some extent. And, and that gives people an opportunity to not be so concerned about, about things. The other, uh, so, but every time I looked at the plans, they had taken the windows out. And the, because it's really hard to balance the air if you have people allowing people to get the window. And balanced air is so important in toxicology. So we were giving the, the uh, uh, the, this Princeton architecture group, all sorts of fits. And I remember making up this, uh, this adage. I said it was an adage of public health, well-known law of public health, of, of toxicology rather, not of public health, that uh, it is unsafe to live in any building uh, designed by architects who do not have superb people who know about ventilation. <laughs> You've got to have the ventilation plan for we want to, uh, and so I just basically said, no, I, I'm not going to be involved in picking the architect, except I'm going to insist that they have a real good group and they build a pretty good group. And the group didn't want us to have windows. So if you, if you notice, what we have is we've got these louvers. So that was the compromise. <laughs> In other words, you can open it slightly, you can open it just a little bit, you could really open it wide and have the air just flow through. That's great. But it For allowed, those of us who have it. Yeah. But it allowed the, the idea that I can control this a bit, yeah. which I think is central to this. Uh, the other thing I, that I did was I, I ordered and we had it, um, um, uh, I, I, I asked for and got uh, the, uh, the furniture. And, you know, plastic furniture, loft gases, it always has a smell. New, uh, it, it's a new, the, you know, the new car smell. Well, okay. I, I insisted that we have the furniture in here, uh, I don't know, four weeks, six weeks, before, that, that it be in place before we moved it in. It was baked out. What? It was baked out. Bob oh. arranged, Snyder arranged for it to be baked out. Oh, okay, so maybe Bob, Bob went beyond me on that. That's great. I, I didn't know that. But my, my, my approach was let's just get but, it in here early. But the stairwells remained poisonous 
for 15 <laughs> years because there was no ventilation there and all the off from the glue for the, the matting on the stairs. Oh, they were horrible. Gee, I didn't you you may have thing. taken the elevator. Well, no, I always no, I always walk. Well, you have to Oh, answer. God, it was awful. Well, I was here on the ground floor, though. <laughs> so I came right in. Yeah. The other thing that I did, and, and you may remember, um, was that we had a lot of plants around. Because I was sure that plants pulled out the, the aldehydes and things like that. But uh, despite all I could do, the Rutgers folks could not get the order in and get it done in such a way to, that we'd already moved in before the plants were here. No, I... I I, I encourage everybody to have pictures of their family and whatnot up. I mean, the difference, this is, this is a room that's obviously worked in. But if you go into an office that's completely sterile, there's nothing on the walls, there's nothing but brand new furniture, it's to me a lot more of a kind of place that's scary in terms of old things are off gassing and whatnot than, than it is something where you see a picture of a, you know, chocolate is the answer no matter what the question is. <laughs> I mean, those are things that make it more homey, if you will. And so we worked on that issue. Um, I'm trying to think of the, there, were, there were there were some other I thought telling examples of what what it was like to get it going, but the the major thing was getting the NIEHS center and the major reason we were able to get the NIEHS center. I remember the the peer reviewers were people who were from existing centers, uh, or who would love to have a center. Some little oh well if if these guys don't get it, uh, and um, we worked real hard on on that. Uh, uh, Audrey Gotch was superb. Uh, in helping us with, uh, she didn't, wasn't allowed to present, but in helping us in just how to organize things. <laughs> uh, I, I remember um, uh, we picked up the peer reviewers by our cars because uh, the Rutgers vans, which we were going to pick them up from, from New Brunswick, were not air conditioned, and it was turned, the weather was predicted to be really hot there and was during the time they came, and <laughs> you just you don't want a bunch of people showing up here just in a bad mood. And it was the kind of thing that, because, you know, they, it's an air conditioned van. Uh, so it's just these little things like that. Um, Details. Uh, so, I, I, and, and again, similarly, uh, the uh, the growth of the graduate programs, I think, were really crucial. You got the you got the, the different uh, uh, you you made the interdisciplinary thing works because not so much that the faculty were willing to work with each other, but the graduate students were willing to work with each other, and they got to know each other. And they got to inform the faculty of oh well, there's something related to this that's going on in this other division, or even in the same department. And, you know, very often people don't know what's going on in the other, and and, and then you find out about. The, uh, uh, the possible interactions. So these graduate programs were superb. Uh, the uh, the public health program uh, developed. Um, uh, Rutgers had uh, been turned down by the state uh, board of higher education for a public health program for an MPH that was that was. Uh, uh, going to be involved with Newark, and, and, and it, it was not possible. Uh, they, they didn't like it, they couldn't prove it. But we started it again on the basis of needing environmental health as a public health discipline with the exposure assessment and everything, and uh, with Audrey's background uh, in, in public health and health education, uh, and did it narrowly on the environment rather than on the broad public health. But enough of the other public health to be able, the rest of public health, to be able to get accreditation from the Council on Education and Public Health, and got it through the um, the state bureaucracy. And the state bureaucracy is so high. I took a picture of the smallest um, person we had working for us. I can't remember her name. Uh, and a pile of, uh, uh, of of different documents that we needed just to show <laughs> just to show how much stuff was done. Christy Whitman, when she came in and uh, looked at it at the bureaucracy, just basically said, "Well, forget that. Let the schools do whatever they want. <laughs> you know, as long as they get accredited nationally, they don't have to get accredited through the state." And got rid of this whole board of higher education of, of the state. Uh, but we got we got in before that, and uh, well, again, that was. All right, so I'll tell an anecdote uh, that I told it when Audrey, uh, at the time there was a party for Audrey. Uh, she got to be tired of it, but it, it was very telling. Audrey, again, uh, she said to us about the arrangements, uh, she came to me and she said, Bernie, um, you know, uh, uh, these are public health people going to coming on, on, on the 
uh, Council on Education and Public Health. Uh, I know you like to bring Dunkin' Donuts to the thing. <laughs> Maybe you should do it. And I said, Audrey, no, no, you bring whatever you want. <laughs> You're in charge of that. I will. I promise you I will not bring any donuts. So Audrey made this really nice spread, and there were you know, vegetables and, and fruit all over the place. The first person who came in from the accrediting body yes. took a look at the grapes and said, how could you possibly have grapes? Cesar Chavez says we should not be buying grapes. <laughs> <laughs> ever since then, I would tell that story. Because uh, what I told her afterwards, I said, nobody's ever boycotted donuts, so you don't have to worry about that. So, uh, you know, the, the, these, but, but we sailed through on that. We uh, developed the, uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, the 11th or 12th uh, uh, program in public health. And we had over two. We ended up with over 200 students, which was larger than many of the schools of public health. Uh, uh, and we did it because we worked at night. Uh, we, we taught at night, so we took advantage of the of the of the facilities being here, but unused in the evening, and aimed at people who were out working, not people, not students just graduating and then going to public health. Uh, the NIH grants that were received by the faculty. I mean, it just was just flew up. Oh. Uh, and an anecdote about the name. So how do we get this awful name, Environmental and Occupational Health Science Institute? Mike Gow is wonderful with this. You know, it sounds like a horse sneezing or something like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the way he did it. Um, and we had, um, uh, at the 10th anniversary, one of the people we had here for a special thing was Tom Kane, who'd been governor at the time, who was a really strong supporter of us, and he made fun of it. So I got up and told him that it was his fault. And explain that what had happened was um, he had put in his uh, 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 state of the state message um, in, I guess, about, about the year that we were, probably 1986 or something like that, uh, that there will be an Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute in Piscataway, New Jersey to do this, what the state needs to respond to this. Where did he get that idea? <laughs> Well, no, that just came out of, the, out of all the politics and whatnot. But we then ran into the problem with the Treasury Building. They, you know, who basically said absolutely correctly that just because the, the governor says in his state of state message doesn't mean anything. I, you know, where, where's the money going to be, and will this be high enough priority? And so, uh, from then on, what we did is like, we took this thing, which was not in capital letters in the state of the state message, environmental, occupational, health sciences, to put capital E, capital O, and whatnot, and says this is, and, and, and named it that, so that we could deal with the state officials who were skeptical about whether they should find money for this new building, and right. were able to do it that way. And the second year, so they gave us uh, some amount of money for the, for the first year, which was enough to dig the hole in the ground, and then the second year came up, and the state was in budgetary trouble. There was only two things funded in the capital budget. One was a prison, and the other was the rest of the money to build this, this institute, which... Um, and they mixed them up by mistake. <laughs> 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 they could well have. So I, you know, I, if you give me some more time, <laughs> in advance notice, I probably could have come up with some more, more, more important you're, things. And I'm sure I've left out a lot, of, to a lot of things that people would, would feel bad about because they, I should be I mentioned but, the occupational medicine residency is an obvious yeah. step forward. The clinic uh, was, was something which, in, until the new leadership came in, nobody noticed that you weren't paying. <laughs> <laughs> paying rent for the clinic, yes, right. because I mean, the argument was that the clinic was uh, that there was no rent needed because the clinic was was an integral part of our research program for which we got the NIEHS center. So again, oh, one of the most important decisions we made early on is we were given a choice between uh, basically keeping our own indirect cost recovery. But having to pay for light and heat and snow renewal, renewal and uh, everything else. Two million. The reason you couldn't park in the parking lot today is our two million dollar new roof that they're still putting down. Okay. Well, <laughs> it wasn't for capital costs, though, but it was for the the other the other stuff. And, um, yeah, Mary Zahor, who was um, we had superb staff. I'm sure still superb staff. But uh, uh, we got I got a budget person, Mary Zahor, and. Um, I was told that I wasn't allowed to have a budget person because you know, we weren't at a high enough level in the, in the table of organization, and I, and I absolutely insisted on it. And she found 
first early on she found they were double billing they were billing us they were billing our grants rather than double because every time that they got at and this is when we were still over in the other building every time uh, you got authorized to buy something uh, you know you sent out a thing they deducted and then they deducted again when you got it uh, but um, the first time it snowed after we moved into this building we got this really high bill and Mary was the one who uh, figured out that they were charging us for the entire Bush campus <laughs> 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 yeah. and, uh, we were told that that was a uh, I, I made a big deal about it because I wanted to make sure that they knew that we were looking and and uh, uh, as far as I know, that kind of thing happening, and because we, we were no longer these patsies who were, you know, uh, we would catch it if they did it. So I would like to suggest or comment that one of the things you haven't mentioned is your impact, you on faculty recruitment, and those of us who have been here since the very beginning, it's in large part due to you, but we have stayed here even though you left us yeah. because of what you built here, what you started here? I, I, when I get to think about my career, I'm proudest of the fact that neither here in New Jersey nor in, uh, uh, at the School of Public Health in Pittsburgh when I was dean did I lose anybody to another university. I mean, people went off work for FDA or whatnot, but to another university, a faculty member, my management approach, I, I used to make a strategic plan every year between me and my computer, not to, 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 to go out. And the top of my list was what faculty are crucial to this program and what am I going to do to make sure that they don't leave? Uh, and whether it be just patting him on the back for, oh, another good paper, <laughs> or, you know, or whatever. I mean, it, 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 to me, that's, that's it, 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 you know, the, the only real important thing you do in, in the kind of administrative academia is to recruit well, you, and maintain good faculty. You started my career because I remember giving you my very first grant, and you looked at it and gave it back to me in 10 minutes and said, where's the hypothesis? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, look, I mean, you, you really do, you, all, all three of you were. And actually, how you were recruited, I think I was still in... Uh, well, I, I called you and because I, I had met you the year before when you offered me a job and I didn't come because you were leaving. And then I called, then Michael re-offered me the job and I said, well, where's Bernie? And he said, well, you'll have to call him. And you said... You, reading between the lines, you said you were coming back, but you wouldn't officially say it. Yeah. So I took the gamble. Yeah. yeah. And, the, the, uh, the, go the government's an interesting place. Uh, the number of rumors, uh, if somebody didn't like what you were doing uh, within the within your bureaucracy, and I think there were 1,800 people working at, I mean, at, at EPA, if they didn't like what you were doing, they would rumor that you were leaving. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I, the, you know, who wants to, because that's the usual thing, people, right. I, as I did, I just lasted two years. Um, so you never want to, the, you know, I mentioned before how I never think of things at the time, I think of them afterwards, what it is I should have said. You and everybody else. Okay. Um, the one time I thought of something on time, okay, uh, was uh, I got a call from a, uh, a member of the press saying that uh, uh, I, I understand you're leaving to go to Temple University. I said, I don't know where you heard that. He said, well, I, I heard it from a good enough source that I'm going to print it unless you're willing to absolutely deny it. I said, I'll tell you what, uh, and quote me on this if you want. The last time I was in Temple was when my son was born. <laughs> <laughs> You know, once in a lifetime you can have a good line you can think of. I'm always so impressed by these people who are just, you know, they're asked these questions by the press. And I had press training at, 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 when I was at, uh, in, in, in uh, went to work for the, in, in the administration. I mean, it was at the basement of the White House. They had a, 
the whole press thing set up, and this very nice man would basically say, okay, I'm going to do an interview with you and video you, and then you're going to see, we're going to go over how to do it better. And he starts out by taking this, this microphone, putting it right in my face, so that he's literally spitting at me, and he's saying, how can you as a physician work for the Reagan administration that's killing all these babies? <laughs> and the video shows me going, ah! <laughs> And I always, I was always sorry I never asked for the video because. I had, but, and then he went through, and so I would watch people like Ruckelshaus uh, with some insight as to how he put together the how he was always no matter what the what the what was asked he he always walked in there with his ideas of what he wanted to get the press to know.